Welcome to the Shuby Show, where sports, movies, TV shows, technology, history, and more come to life. Now, please be seated and get ready for some more never-ending nonsense with yours truly, Shuby. This is the Shuby Show with yours truly, Carson Schubert, and today on the show, we've got a guest who is named Dusty O'Connell, and Dusty is going to talk about um, his love for food, and he's also a bartender, so he's going to be talking about his life as a bartender, and his love for food, and we might dip into a little bit of Vikings talk as well just depending on where our conversation leads. Um, uh, for the show, reminders, you can follow me on Twitter, at Radio Rubin. Follow uh, the show on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, all at The Shuby Show. And if you have inquiries about the show, somebody you want me to get on the show, or somebody you know that would be good with sports, movies, TV shows, technology, history, or anything else, just, just maybe think they'd be a good guest, Tell them to email me, or you can email me, theshubyshow at gmail.com, and visit our website, theshubyshow.com. That's going to do it. We're going to get Dusty in, and we'll be right back here in a moment. You are listening to The Shuby Show. Dusty O'Connell joins me after this. Welcome back to the show, and now I'm joined by Norse Code's own Dusty O'Connell, the host of the show, and he's also a bartender, and he loves food like most Americans. Dusty, a pleasure to have you on the show. Thank you. Carson, it's a pleasure to be here. This is, uh, this is actually my... So, <laughs> it's funny. Uh, I am most famous for Norse Code, and I, I'm actually doing air quotes right now around the word famous. Because, uh, like, the, the degree of fame that I've achieved from Norse Code is so great that you are the first person to ever have me on a podcast as a guest. <laughs> oh, wow. I have, I have not been on many podcasts myself. I actually, I've only been on one. So, uh, yeah, it's, it's – and you've been in the podcasting business longer than I have, so you've really been without uh, being on another podcast for a long time without – Without being the host, obviously, of your own. Well, I tell you what, man. Uh, Norse Code is approaching its fifth season, and if this is a business, then I would advise all of you out there to find a different one. It is not particularly lucrative. But uh, <laughs> I, I will say this. Um, you um, brought up something that I think is very interesting. And like on, on Norse Code, I kind of take a back seat because... My you know, primary interest, my professional interest personally is food and beverage. And uh, you bring up something, you know, most, most honest Americans enjoy food, right? Mm -hmm. So I take issue with the label like foodie. Like when people call <laughs> themselves foodies, I think that's just like a really dumb thing to say about yourself because it implies that there are people out there that don't like food. Yeah. And like everyone, eat, if you're alive, you ate food today, probably. <laughs> if you're alive and healthy, you ate food probably two or three times today, maybe four <laughs> or five if you're, you know, lucky. And <laughs> that's right. Like to, to claim to just like add E to the word and claim like extra enjoyment from it is, you know, a little, it's a bit much, <laughs> uh, a, little, a little contrived. How about food connoisseur? Is that, is that a better term maybe? Well, I tell you what, I'm uh, I'm very lucky. I am in a relationship with a chef, and consequently, I get to. I mean, when when I was young, when I was very young, I was a very picky eater. You know, it was uh, I was a like slice of craft single with some mayonnaise on white bread kind of kid. Yeah. Or like like plain mac and cheese, you know, that kind of thing. But uh, you know, now working in food and beverage for as long as I have and, you know, kind of having the, the personal experience that I have, I, I haven't really had as much opportunity to travel as I would like. 
you know, I want to see the world, but yeah, it costs money, it turns out. And uh, Americans are not necessarily the most popular people in the world right now. So for me, (laughs) food and beverage is an opportunity to kind of experience other cultures Mm. through the lens of my mouth. Yeah. Oh, that's 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 a good way of putting that. Yeah, it's I in being in Northwest Iowa, as I've mentioned to you many times, it is very hard to get a taste of multiple different cultures. There's about three different things. You get Italian food, which really is not Italian. Pizza is pretty much American anymore. Um, you get uh, Chinese and Mexican food. Those are basically the three different ones other than American, obviously. So I really don't get much exposure, even though there is a Vietnamese restaurant in Sioux Falls. I have not been able to go to that one. I've been to a Japanese restaurant, and I think we left because we had no idea what was on the menu. <laughs> <laughs> well, and, that, and that's, so that's one great thing about you know having a chef in your life is uh, a lot of these you know unfamiliar ingredients and unfamiliar preparations mm. become accessible when you have somebody else to kind of guide you through the process. And then once, you know, it's, it's like the first time you get into a hot tub, you know, your, your feet are like super hot and you're like, I don't know if I really want to do this. But then by the time you're knee deep, you're kind of like, all right, this isn't so bad. And then pretty soon you're like neck deep and floating and you're just like, oh, this is awesome. <laughs> like, yeah, for me, I mean, growing up in North Dakota was part of the struggle. You know, I, I grew up 60 miles south of the Canadian border. I had a lot of the same struggles that you do, just l- literally finding anything out of my comfort zone to eat. You know, chi cheese was about it. Yeah. And I mean, don't get me wrong. I love a uh, 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 pan seared burrito as much as the next guy. I still my burrito consumption is still uh, pretty on point. Don't get me wrong. <laughs> but to be able to kind of experience other cultures a little bit more in uh, in a more varied way was was really gratifying. And it's like so 10 years ago. You probably would never have seen, you know, a Vietnamese restaurant in Sioux Falls or, you know, a Vietnamese restaurant in Fargo or an Indian restaurant in Grand Forks or anything like that. But, you know, we're, we're kind of becoming homogenized as a culture to a point where, you know, there are all these individual niches all over the country. Mm-hmm. And as these people go, so goes their food. Yeah. And that really, like, to me, that's one of the, the, the best things about being an American is that, like, like, think about England. Really amazing curry. Really, like, every... Every place that they colonized, they took some food influence from. Yeah. And, I mean, they, they made it, you know, quintessentially British. But at the same time, because, like, their food influence is kind of limited to the places they colonized, you can't get a good taco in London. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Like, I, I've, had, I've had lots of people come back and be like, oh, you know what's crazy about Europe? They don't have ranch dressing there. Like, anywhere. <laughs> oh, my gosh. That's <laughs> I, terrible. <laughs> So if you, y- y'all out there, if you go to Europe, bring ranch if you want it. I mean, you don't you don't have to want ranch, but if you do, you're not going to find it. Oh man, I better not but order it, any French fries down there. Oh, is that your thing, French uh, French fries and ranch? Yes, love it. Oh my gosh, it's so good. Um, mm. The uh, the bar where I work, we do uh, French fries with uh, like evaporated malt. So you ever put uh, malt vinegar on your French fries? I have not. That sounds interesting. Oh, that, it's a Canadian thing. It's like a like malt vinegar is very sweet, uh, but oh, it goes okay. great on fries. It's like a little bit salty, a little bit sour. It really goes with crispy fries, makes them a little bit soft. Super good. Hmm. So uh, the bar where I work, uh, it's called Williams and Graham in Denver. It was uh, it was rated uh, one of the 50 best bars in the world a few oh. years ago by uh, by some magazine. I think it was like Food and Wine. Some I don't know. It doesn't really matter. It's a bunch of cocktail people talking about how great cocktails are, and they decided that our place was pretty great. <laughs> well, that's uh, good. But the, so there, there's my plug for Williams and Graham. If you're uh, if you're ever in Denver, stop in and say hi, and uh, tell me that you heard me on the Shuby Show, and I'll <laughs> uh, I'll do something nice for you. I'll get you some of these fries with uh, with the malt gastrique on them. It's just like uh, it's like evaporated malt vinegar, so it becomes like a really sweet, like balsamic flavored syrup, and uh, we serve them with this like black pepper mayonnaise. Ooh. And it's just about the best goddamn thing in the world. And you, you think of French fries, you think of salt and ketchup, right? That's like mm. kind of a McDonald's experience. It's like the, the cultural experience. This is this turns it on its head. And let me tell you, it is every bit as good. Man, that's that's very interesting because, yeah, like like you said, that's kind of what the normal thing is. Ketchup with, with your uh, fries, but 
That's it's one of those things where we as Americans and I'm sure many other cultures have done this with their own food too. You try it different ways. You try it with different things. Um, like my aunt, she loves to put ketchup on her eggs, and I can't stand that, but uh, she does. And... Oh man, see, I'm a, I'm a ketchup on eggs guy. Oh, I, you I, are okay. Not, okay. not fr- uh, scrambled eggs only. Yeah. And I am I am don't. Well, I guess I'm I'm saying it on a podcast, so I guess I'm probably not really keeping it a secret. But I am not above putting ketchup inside an omelet. Oh, that would maybe be interesting. But like fried eggs, no. If I, I like my yolks runny, I like to dip my toast in them. It's very. Oh yes. That's, yes. that's a whole different thing. That's like, that's like an entirely different food. But it, <laughs> it, it, it's it's funny because there's about half the populace that's like really committed to ketchup on eggs, and another half that is just like absolutely not. No, I put I put pepper on, and I hope to have. If it's scrambled eggs, I like to have green pepper, onions, cheese, and all that other stuff in there too, because I think yeah. that makes it the best. But the uh, what you're describing is a a Denver omelet. Denver omelet, yeah. Oddly enough. <laughs> yes, those are good too. I've had I've had a few of those. Unfortunately, not one from the actual Denver. <laughs> well, they're uh, they're 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 better other places. They're. they're there are better things to to do in Denver than uh, than the Denver omelet. <laughs> I would say. All right. Well, we've we've spent quite a bit of time without even getting into our into our show here. So some hot French fry takes. Let's yes. So far, hot French fry so far takes tonight. and some hot eggs with no ketchup or ketchup takes. Well, maybe not so hot. Maybe it is pretty fifty fifty. I have no idea. But oh, you're about to find out <laughs> at Radio Ruben on Twitter <laughs> is where you can find Carson if you have a particular opinion about ketchup on eggs. At the Shuby Show on Twitter also. At the Shuby Show. <laughs> and yes. at Radio please, Ruben. Please tweet the Shuby Show with <laughs> your... Sorry. Yes. Oh, it's, it's your show. I'll let you drive the bus. I'm sorry. I just, I, I just, get, into, I just get into the you're mode. So... I, I do one thing. <laughs> you're so used to the hosting. And uh, Dusty O'Connell is at Dusty O'Connell on Twitter. That's two N's and two L's and one O. If you didn't, well, two O's actually. Never mind. I lied. One O. No, nope, only one. Then the C, then only one O in the second part of, yeah. If that makes any sense, hopefully, hopefully the listeners can figure it out. And there's no apostrophe, obviously, <laughs> no. in your name on Twitter, so they don't have to worry about that part. <laughs> It's true. It turns out the apostrophe breaks SQL queries. So uh, having my name in databases has been uh, an interesting experience for my entire adult life. <laughs> so again, that's Dusty O'Connell on on Twitter, and you can tweet him about how much you love or hate ketchup with eggs, or how much you love <laughs> those French fries that he that he's served or that you've had somewhere else. I can't wait to hear about it <laughs> <laughs> so dusty uh apparently uh you've been a bartender for a while um you talked a little bit about your love for food a little bit obviously as you said everybody loves food if you don't then you're probably dead or you probably have an dead. issue <laughs> we're very sick yes probably on your way out yeah um so uh what what brings you uh to different kinds of food i know you kind of talked about different cultures and things but what is something you enjoy about food that maybe somebody else doesn't um well so for me okay so well a a little bit of background just kind of about like how i ended up in this spot uh i started bartending when i was in college back in grand forks uh go fighting hawks i it was 2006 2005 2006 thereabouts i just wanted a job that would pay me a lot of money and I had an opportunity to work at uh, what was at the time a pretty great restaurant in Grand Forks, the Green Mill, a uh, an upper Midwest chain that actually serves some pretty great uh, Chicago-style deep dish pizza. Uh, but that's neither here nor there. I got my start in the hospitality industry, just uh, pouring beers and blending margaritas for them. And, uh, you know, the money was nice and the people were fun. And I just sort of fell naturally into, like, I... I like throwing parties. I enjoy hanging around people. I'm obviously a, a sociable person who enjoys a good chat. I wouldn't be here right now if I wasn't. <laughs> and it was just sort of a natural fit. So then I, I graduated and moved to Colorado and did some other stuff for a while. Um, 
played poker on the internet for a little while, but then, um, thanks to a certain piece of legislation, it was no longer possible to do that for money <laughs> back in, uh, that was like 2011. So, uh, about that time I thought to myself, well, Dusty, you're going to have to go back and get a job. <laughs> what are you going to do? And so I, uh, I dabbled in public radio for a little while and, uh, I don't know if you all know this. But you don't really get paid very much money to work in public radio, mm, especially part time. So uh, <laughs> I kind of got back into the hospitality industry, just sort of like falling butt backwards into it. And uh, I got a couple of really great opportunities to uh, work in some pretty cool restaurants. And I kind of fell into bartending, but more so I fell into like like craft bartending. Like I was working in Japanese restaurants, one in particular in uh in boulder colorado that had a pretty expansive cocktail bar alongside like a big you know japanese whiskey and soju actually they call it shochu and like sake list so i, I kind of got exposed to like food from across the world and alcohol from across the world all at once and for me like since then like that that just like lit the fuse on a firecracker of like love for craft bartending. And, you know, now I'm feeling like I'm at a spot where, you know, we're going to be like, we, we, we want to reclaim the title of uh, one of the 50 best in the world or something, I guess. And uh, for me, the relationship that, you know, food has, I mean, beyond the, you know, cultural aspect of it, it really informs the way that I make drinks because, you know, some people make drinks that try to create like an emotional connection for people. Like there's a, there's a guy that makes a, uh, a cocktail with uh, like butter washed rum and uh, Coca-Cola and like salt syrup. And it tastes like the movies. It tastes hmm. like buttered popcorn and Coca-Cola. Hmm. And it, I mean, I honestly, I don't really like the cocktail that much. I think it tastes kind of weird, but I get why people like it because yeah. it reminds them of a thing that they love. You know, it, it makes that emotional connection for people. I don't yeah. really do that. I like the idea of taking flavors that you wouldn't necessarily think of combining and putting them together in a drink and serving them to you in an attractive way that makes you kind of question what you knew about flavors about liquor, about, you know, what can go into a drink and kind of what you can, uh, what you can learn from taking a sip of a cocktail. So you're saying I should come to Denver when I turn 21 in about a month. I think everyone should come to Denver. I mean, I don't think, <laughs> I don't necessarily think anyone else should try to live here. Like there's, there's too many people for how many apartments we have right now, but, uh, <laughs> But uh, you should definitely come to Denver because uh, the well, and what's great about Denver is that, you know, it's a rapidly growing city. We went out to dinner tonight at a place that had like a, like a view of downtown and I counted nine cranes building skyscrapers downtown. Oh, man. Add that That's to the crane crazy. that I can actually I can see two. I'm standing on my balcony right now and I can see two cranes. And then if I turn my head 90 degrees, I can see another crane. And these are all separate from the nine that we saw downtown. So it's, uh, it's an exciting time to be in Denver. There's a lot of growth happening and a lot of, uh, you know, interesting influence. You know, it's, uh, it's a great time to be here because there are a lot of people that are curious about a lot of things. And uh, I'm enthusiastic about the opportunity to, you know, show people some stuff that they may not have thought of before. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, uh, from the bartending side of things, uh, Dusty, uh, what, uh, what do you love about bartending and, uh, what, what draws you to it other than, uh, maybe just trying different things, um, alcohol or whatever, uh, maybe it's, uh, the people or, uh, any other, th anything else? Well, so I don't just work in a bar. I have my own, um, like private event bartending company. Mm. where I go out and I, you know, bartend at weddings or birthday parties or, you know, just a, a random cocktail party or, you know, any, anytime somebody wants a party and they want a professional bartender, my services are available. And 
I started to do on that because I thought to myself, you know, after after my career crisis in uh, in my mid twenties, I was like, well, what do I what do I really like to do? And because I was in my mid twenties and you know, and dumb idiot, I was like, well, I really like going to parties and I like throwing parties. So how can I hook myself up with that? And uh, the answer turned out to be like event bartending. You know, it's a it's an opportunity for me to and dude, you know, I I love weddings. I don't know if you've been to very many of them, but everybody's yeah. there trying to have a good time. Everybody just wants like it's a joyous occasion, and mm-hmm. you know I enjoy sharing that with people. You know, and yeah. uh, I'm very lucky to be able to do that sort of thing on my own and also work in a place like Williams and Graham is the kind of place where people go to celebrate their anniversary or to celebrate birthdays. So, you know, four or five days a week, I'm surrounded by people that are celebrating this or that thing. You know, they're trying to have a good time. You know, they're not, they're not coming in with like a big frown on their face or whatever. And I enjoy that, uh, that desire to make merriment. And, uh, yeah, that, uh, that's probably the, uh, the primary driver of uh, of my love for my work, but I mean, it just comes down to enjoying other people's company. Yeah, honestly, well, and and frankly, uh, the free booze doesn't hurt either. There's lots, <laughs> lots of free booze. <laughs> and uh, like, and I kind of mentioned this already, but I'm sure you get to try many different things, so you can kind of perfect like, oh, this is my drink. This is this is what I have. This is my this is my usual or whatever. Exactly. Well, and, you know, you have uh, so many opportunities to be creative. Mm. You know, every every time I do a party, I try to make a different like I, I try to do at least one different cocktail for every party. You know, I've got a few that I've got. A few, it's like uh, it's like when you go to see your favorite band performing concert. You know, they've got their their standards. They'll play like three or four songs off their first album, you know, that'll get everybody like jumping up and down. Mm. But chances are during their set, they're going to play, you know, a couple of songs off their brand new album or maybe something that's not on any album that you've never heard before. Yeah. And the opportunity to kind of do that with beverages really appeals to me because uh, I don't really get a chance to flex my creative muscle in very many other ways. Yeah. Except for podcasting. (laughs) <laughs> that, that's, but I, I think well so my role on north code is more technical yeah. than creative i mean i i crack jokes and i do the the like money ask promo a little differently every time but other than that you know my yeah. role is just to watch the clock and make sure a reef doesn't go on too long <laughs> yeah 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 so uh now uh talk a little bit about your history of bartending i think you kind of talk touched on it a little bit um, but when did you start bartending and how long have you been doing it? Well, it, uh, so I, I did probably two years. Yeah, it was uh, about mid 2005 to 2008. I was at the Green Mill in Grand Forks. Okay. And uh, that was kind of my initial like introduction to alcohol. I was, you know, early 20s, you know, college age. And then I was out of the game until uh, 2011, which is a long time. I was I was extremely rusty. I interviewed for some jobs. And, uh, whew, boy, did I fall on my face. Like imagine the worst pro day you can imagine. I ran like a, like an 11 second 40 yard dash. <laughs> like, That's better just, than mine. <laughs> just genuinely embarrassing. Like, you know, you know, that feeling you ever, you ever interview for a job and you walk out the door and you're like, they are never going to call me back. Like you're, you're just certain that they are, they don't give a crap about you anymore. <laughs> yeah. I felt that feeling like every day for weeks. And then I realized I had to set my sights a little lower. And uh, luckily it worked out, you know, uh, hard work and perseverance paid off. I was able to find some good mentorship. Uh, Stanley Yusinowitz at uh, Japango in Boulder was uh, an instrumental part of me kind of getting my, my craft cocktail legs under me. And then, I mean, a lot of it was, uh, and this is the thing, you know, people ask me all the time, they're like, oh man, bartending must be such I'm like, how much do you like doing dishes? Cause, <laughs> cause if you don't like washing glasses, you will not get far in this industry, let yeah. me tell you. But, yeah. uh, but, but beyond that, like, people ask me, like, oh, you know, it must be such a cool job. Like, how do, you, how do you get to be, like, a really good bartender? Do you need some kind of, like, certification? Do you need a license? And it's like, well, the only real important certification you need is uh, 
and it varies from state to state, but it's basically just proof that you took a class that shows that you know the rules about over-serving people and how to tell if somebody's had too much to drink. Mm. Beyond that, it's uh, work experience and a lot of self-directed study. There's yeah. a lot of great books out there. Um, Dave Arnold, whom I actually I was very lucky today, I got to watch him do a seminar and uh, we can talk a little more about that later. But uh, Dave Arnold's book, uh, Liquid Intelligence, is uh, a must read for anyone interested in the craft cocktail world. Uh, David Embury's The Fine Art of Mixing Drinks is uh, considered like the first. It was written in the late 19. Well, the first edition came out in like 1948. And uh, the second edition came out um, after the end of well, during the Korean War. It was like 1951 or 1952. But that's considered like the first like American like cocktail compendium that tries to describe like uh, Embury wasn't a bartender. He was a lawyer who just loved to drink. And he took his analytical mind and wrote everything he could about the different styles of cocktail, about all the different liquors that he knew at the time, about how to tell the difference between, ooh, excuse me, between a good one and a bad one. And uh, I mean, he really like like his book kind of set the stage for the the future of American cocktails, which is kind of where we're at now. Um, but yeah, just, uh, just a lot of like reading and, uh, and drinking, which are two things that you wouldn't think would go together <laughs> mm, <yeah>. necessarily. <laughs> right. <laughs> but, uh, but a lot of, a lot of working and, uh, and reading and drinking has, uh, has gotten me to, to where I am today. And also, um, being just like a, a convivial person, like mm. being a nice guy. Cause like one of the things that I run into doing uh, private events is uh, oftentimes there'll be kids there, like, like little kids. And, you know, some of them just want Shirley temples, but if you can be nice to them and, really you know, it, and if you brought what, but dude, I, I make a crazy good green apple Shirley temple. Ooh, you, I you probably never... didn't even know that was a thing. No, I didn't. And, I'm coming dude, to Denver even, right even, away. <laughs> uh, I'll send you the recipe. Uh, okay. you, can, you can make a syrup at home. It's really easy. Um, but kids love this stuff, and parents love this stuff. Well, well, parents love that their kids love it. And to me, like being a bartender is not just about slinging booze. It's about kind of being the life of the party. Mm. You know? Yeah. So that's uh, that's kind of where I came from. Yeah. Yeah, it's and it's one of those things too where a lot of people from every single uh background they they drink. They they occasionally have have a beer. They occasionally have a mixed drink. They occasionally take a couple shots, you know, that kind of thing because Well, they've they've it's, found it's, traces of uh beer and mead in like 5,000-year-old Egyptian vessels. You know, yeah. people have been Drinking alcohol for uh, centuries, a very long yeah. time. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's 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 crazy how many people drink. And you know, there's a lot of people uh, re- religiously that are against drinking. And I mean, to an extent, I could say, yeah, you don't want to go too far from a religious standpoint. But I think. I think people, relig- even if you're religious, you should be able to have a drink every now and then. I mean, there's nothing. Should be nothing against that, in my opinion. But uh... well, and, and speaking purely professionally as a bartender, I have worked parties that were all teetotalers. You know, I, I have worked parties where all, the only things that I have shown up with were ingredients to make mocktails because people want the bartender experience. Because it's not just you know being a bartender isn't just you know having a guy to pour you booze. I mean, it can be, right. but that's not the kind of bartending I do. It's about being the life of the party. And you know, I've done entire parties. Or I just show up with a bunch of non-alcoholic ingredients and everybody has a great time. Yeah, yeah. Sometimes people just need somebody that's willing to laugh louder than everybody else. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes, that's that's very true. So uh, let's talk a little bit about uh, more about your bartending uh, life here. Uh, what, what would you say is the worst part about it uh, for you besides the, the drunken buffoons every now and then? <laughs> Uh, the buffoons can be rough. <laughs> um, luckily I work in a place where I don't have to deal with too much buffoonery anymore. <laughs> um, the, okay. So there, I, I have two answers to this question. 
the the quickest and easiest answer is the late nights. Mm. Uh, for example, I worked last night and then I had this uh, seminar today. Oh. Uh, semin- seminar started at 9 a.m. <laughs> and I got home from work at about 3:45. Oh. A.m. Yikes. This morning. And you know, you know how you, you are when you get home from work. You know, you don't just like walk in the door and just like drop all your clothes off and fall into bed and pass out. No, you need like, uh, you know, 30 minutes, maybe an hour to like shower, chill, kind of decompress. Yeah. Maybe, maybe eat some food or something, you know, do, do human stuff. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. by the time I was done with all my human stuff, it was like four in the morning, four thirty in the morning. So I got a, a healthy four hours of sleep before... <laughs> prying myself out of bed and chugging a gallon of coffee and going off to do this <laughs> thing all day. So that's that's maybe not awesome. Um, AeroPress coffee? <laughs> uh, no, I, I needed way more coffee than an AeroPress could make at one time. <laughs> uh, it was it was two French presses, one after the other. Yeah, okay. Um, we'll have to have a whole other episode on, on AeroPress and, and, and your <laughs> coffee style. <laughs> fans, fans of Norse Code will be very familiar with my uh, with my takes on coffee. But uh, the other thing that is um, maybe not so much my favorite is when people go to bars, they complain a lot. Oh, yeah. And I get to hear a lot. I mean, and, and I don't like, I don't necessarily share in these conversations, but, you know, these people are sitting, you know, three feet in front of me. I, I get to eavesdrop on a lot of weird stuff. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> and they're... they're let me tell you, I've I've got some some hilarious stories. I have a I have a story that's not appropriate for the show about why a woman hates Christmas, but it's oh, uh, uh, it's one of my my favorite stories of all time. I am grateful that I am not this poor woman. Um, <laughs> but you know, you see you see bad dates. You see people come out after work, and you see like like two people that work in the same office will come out for drinks, and then they'll yeah. just sit across from each other and snipe at all their coworkers behind their backs. Mm. And it's just like a, it's an atmosphere that lends itself not only to like conviviality and good times, but also just like, like backstabbing and cheating and just like all the, all the worst, like vicey impulse people. Mm. And, you know, we, we'd all like to live in a world where that sort of thing isn't real, but you know, it is. And yep. look, I, I, I can appreciate the value of a place like a bar to be able to do that sort of thing because, you know, a, a bartender zip lips. Everything everything that happens at that bar is, is, is treated with the utmost confidence. It's like, it's like low-rent therapy, basically. And the best yeah. part about it is that oftentimes I don't even have to participate. But uh, <laughs> the worst part is I get to hear a lot of people's problems whether I want to or not. Yeah. And I suppose if you ever have, I suppose if you're having a bad day and you hear other people's problems, it's like, oh, that's not even half as bad as what I'm going through right now. Well, one of the uh, one of the best things about doing this for so long is that you really learn to, you know, it's like it's like people in uh, like the medical profession or like in the in in therapy or any any like high stress job. You uh, you learn to compartmentalize. You don't really. Mm-hmm you kind of leave your personal life at home. And like when I'm, when I'm getting set up and I like, I, I step into the bathroom and I get my like apron on and I tighten up my tie and fix my tie clip. That's like, that's like my, my brain's cue. It's just like when we count down for the podcast, it's like three, mm-hmm. two, one, you're on stage. Yep. And, and then, and then I'm on stage and whatever is going on in my life is subjugate to whatever is happening at the bar. You know, it has, very little to do with me and everything to do with making sure that the guest has a good experience, whatever, whatever they think that experience would look like. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, so now uh, we're going to end your bartending experiences and career uh, by talking about some of your favorite drinks. And actually I should say, we're going to talk about your favorite drinks and then uh, I've got a couple uh, top trends in beer and liquor. Uh, that maybe our listeners would like to try or have tried and would agree with you on. So uh, first, uh, Dusty, what are some of your favorite drinks you've tried over the years? Well, I can uh, I can tell you for certain what uh, my favorite classic cocktail of all time is. It's uh, it's called the Aviation. Hmm. Okay. It is a uh, it is a gin based cocktail 
with uh, maraschino cherry liqueur, which is mm-hmm. basically like a like a cherry brandy mm-hmm. that they use uh, the stems and the uh, seeds and the skins of the cherry to make. So okay. it's not like it's not like sweet like syrupy cherry schnapps or anything. It's uh, it'll put some hair on your chest if you drink it alone. Okay. In fact, uh, I actually would not suggest doing that. It's much better in uh, in small doses in a cocktail. Oh, okay. But uh, anyway, uh, gin, maraschino liqueur, uh, a little bit of creme de violette to give it a uh, a nice purple color, mm. and uh, some lemon juice for tartness. Shaken wow. and served with an expressed lemon peel for garnish. Shaken, not stirred. <laughs> so, uh, well, so the uh, the rule for uh, for shaking or stirring a cocktail is if it uh, contains citrus juice, then you shake it. Okay. If it does not, then you stir it. Hmm. And you will note that uh, James Bond dun, does a dun, weird dun, dun, thing dun, dun, by dun. ordering <laughs> <laughs> by ordering a cocktail that is all booze, uh, but he asks for it shaken, which means yep. he probably just wants it extra cold because <laughs> ice runs through his veins. <laughs> yeah, is, that's right. Is my my best guess, but. Uh, <laughs> But speaking of James Bond, um, another one of my favorite cocktails is uh, one that Ian Fleming came up with. It's called the Vesper. Uh, ah. Ian Fleming, of course, is the uh, the author of the James Bond novels. Yep. And uh, this is the, so the original like James Bond martini was uh, equal parts vodka and gin with uh, a French fortified wine called Lille Blanc instead of vermouth. Mm. Shaken, not stirred, and <laughs> served again with lemon peel, ah. and uh, and that is a vesper, which I think is a, a a light and refreshing take on a martini. And I think that like Lille Blanc is a uh, a light enough um, fortified wine where you can really experiment. You can play with different kinds of vodka and different kinds of gin. It was it was a great way for me. So the uh, the Vesper was one of the first like craft cocktails that I like used in my practice and training, mm. and I would just switch out different gins and different vodkas because I knew how the first Vesper I ever tasted tasted. Oh, okay. So then I had a baseline, and you know I would try like ten different gins, you know, not all on the same night, <laughs> in my in my Vespers, and I would get a sense of like, oh, okay, so. Uh, Beef Eater will make a Vesper taste like this, or Bombay Sapphire will make a Vesper taste like this, or Bar Hill, or Dry Town, or, you know, whatever, insert gin here, will make a Vesper taste a certain way. And that's kind of, they call it the, uh, the Mr. Potato Head theory of cocktail making. <laughs> you, can, uh, you can pull his nose out and plug in a different nose and see how it looks or see how it tastes, you know? <laughs> Oh man, that's that's interesting. I you know I wonder from I don't you've seen have you seen Casino Royale? Oh, have I ever? I'm a, I'm a Bond film enthusiast. Oh, that is oh man, I should have had you on for when Roger Moore passed away. But anyways, um I I wouldn't I, have been a good guest for that one. Oh, you're not a Roger Moore guy? I, I mean I I am, but like the the whole point of <laughs> Roger Moore dying was to like do a proper eulogy for him. Yeah. And I would have just said, ah, Daniel Craig is the best Bond. And that's that's <laughs> not fair to Roger. Because yeah. he was an awesome dude. Yes, he was. And I've heard multiple people say that he was also a really good guy in uh, in person, too. So, um, anyways, uh, back on Casino Royale. I wonder if that's where they got the name Vesper Lind from, from that drink. Maybe just the first name, obviously. I don't know why where the Lind would come in, but... Well, no, so if you uh, if you read the novel, uh, I forget which one it is. Um, Bond invents the cocktail in um, the airplane bar, or he has the the airplane like stewardess invent the cocktail for him. And you know they've never made it before. Oh, no, no, it's, it's not an airplane. Ugh. I think it's like a cruise ship or something. Wh- okay. Wherever James Bond is, he gets the bartender to invent the cocktail for him, hmm. and the bartender is like. He tastes it and he's like, oh, this isn't bad. What should I call it? And James Bond is like, call it Vesper. Oh, man. So that what, yeah, that was in a James Bond novel when he did that, huh? Yeah, yeah. That's, uh, I mean, it was, it was Ian Fleming's idea. I mean, obviously yeah. James Bond isn't a real person, but uh, 
But yeah, what? It's, uh, yeah. <laughs> I know you just shocking, ruined right? my whole life, Dusty. <laughs> Spoiler alert. <laughs> <laughs> oh, all right, man. Uh, so that is your favorite drink of all time. Uh, maybe do you have a favorite beer that you like? I think you may have told me this one time. Uh, so my favorite brewery is uh, Avery Brewing Company out of Boulder, Colorado. Okay. They opened just a few months before I was born in uh, fall 1981. And they have been consistently killing it for 35 years, making mm. really amazing. And they've expanded. I don't know how far your listenership extends, and I don't know how far Avery's distribution extends. The, the way that beer makes its way into liquor stores in America is like some organized crime, like godfather mm. nonsense. It is ridiculous. Mm. There is no, there's no rhyme or reason to why places do or don't carry beer from certain breweries. Yeah. But if you, if you ever have a chance to try anything from Avery Brewing Company, try it because all of their like widely distributed beers are probably the best of their style hmm. or second best. Maybe if they're not the best, they're in the top two. Okay. Uh, Avery's India. I've always been a, a hoppy beer enthusiast. I like uh, pale ales, extra pale ales, India pale ales, uh, I fell in love with Avery IPA back in 2008 when I first moved to Colorado. And I, trust me, Colorado has more breweries per square mile than any other state in the country. I can believe it. <laughs> and I've tried a lot of IPAs. I've tried a lot of double IPAs. I've tried quadruple IPAs. I've tried beers from all over the world. Hmm. Still waiting to find a better IPA than Avery. All right. You heard it here. Dusty O'Connell, Avery is the best around. So if you ever have a chance, if you're a beer guy, and if, if you, you like have IPAs, any problems with my beer takes, please tweet at, at Shuby Show oh. on Twitter. <laughs> okay. Oh man, S C H U B Y Show. With all of your negative thoughts about my beard face. <laughs> and then you can subtweet uh, Dusty. <laughs> yeah, please, actually, please tweet me if you want to tell me that you don't like hoppy beer. I would. That's very valuable knowledge. <laughs> all right, well. Uh, uh, so so I, I, I will say, though, that if I had to pick, like, a, so I know, I know all that stuff I said about distribution. If I had to mm. pick a beer that would be available everywhere, that is just like generally very good. Uh, Dogfish Head, I know, distributes nationally. Um, their mm. 60 minute IPA is like the the kind of national gold standard for craft beer. Mm. Uh, you, uh, oh, uh, let me ask you this. I, know, I don't think I ever had a chance. Um, do you guys get Surly beer? I, that uh, where you're at? I have no idea. I, ah. I really don't. Well, uh, when Surly I... is an amazing brewery out of Minneapolis, and their uh, their main like brew pub just closed. They couldn't uh, they couldn't hack having a, a restaurant and brew pub in the same building. So uh, huh. any any chance I get to tell people to buy Surly beer, those guys could really use the support, and they make some really amazing beer as well. So. Hmm. Well, I I can give you an answer to that in about a month, a little over a month. I'll be able to go in and <laughs> look you, and actually uh... tell you. <laughs> <laughs> Once you see the inside of a liquor store, yeah. So that's I, right. I, I just working in a bar. I just forget there are people in the world who might not be twenty one. Yeah, <laughs> that's right. That's right. So uh... well, no, we, we've got a door person that like check. Like by the time they get to me, they've already like passed the gauntlet. Like uh, Williams and Graham is a it's like a speakeasy style bar. It looks like a tiny bookstore, and okay. uh, you you enter the bar. By opening, like, the, the hostess opens a bookcase for you. And then you're, like, let into the actual bar. So by the time mm. I see you, somebody's already checked your ID. And I don't have to worry about any of that bull crap. Uh, okay. Anyway. Huh. Yeah, it's, it's interesting. Uh, here in Iowa, we, <laughs> we don't have that kind of a system, <laughs> unfortunately. That'd be, um, that, That'd be pretty nice, though, because, I mean, like you said, it makes your job easier, and they probably can scan IDs and other things and that kind of thing, so. Exactly. It's safer for everybody. It keeps uh, it keeps everyone honest. Yeah, yeah. 
So, uh, top three trends, in your opinion. We're going to start first with beer. What, are, what do you think are the top three trends, or what do you know for a fact are the top three trends in beer? So, the biggest trend now, at least in, in Colorado, is uh, like sour beer, like farmhouse-style mm. beer. And a big component of that is using uh, wild yeast. Hmm. Like, uh, like when, so, so Belgium has like a long storied history of beer, right? Yeah. Uh, a lot of that is because Belgian monks didn't have a whole lot to do besides like pray and tend their gardens. So they started brewing beer as a way to kind of attract like money to their monastery. Hmm. And, uh, what they would do is, uh, collect yeast that, um, or they, they, they would, uh, collect yeast from the um, tops of their monasteries. Oh. Like, uh, they would uh, set up, like, you know, they would ferment their beer on the on the roofs of their monasteries, and, um, you know, the wind would... Because, uh, so the, the... When you're making ales, as uh, the Belgians did, the, uh, the yeast sits on top of, like, the open barrel mm. of fermenting beer. Okay. So the wind would come and blow some of the foam mm. off and some of the little like yeasties from, uh, from the beer would make their way to other monasteries' beers uh-huh. and uh, maybe change the, uh, the flavor profile a little bit because different, different kinds of yeast um, leave different, like, so alcohol is basically yeast poop. <laughs> yeah. And uh, different yeast has uh, yeast poop that smells and tastes different. Yeah, yeah. So this, this wild yeast, like, uh, propagation all over Belgium was kind of controlled by the monks. Like, they would leave their, their barrels up on the roof for a while to kind of spread their yeast, or they would take it back in once they tasted it, and they were like, oh, no, this is about right. This is kind of what we want. So you get, like, a, like a flavor of the area in your beer is basically mm. what they were going for. And uh, they're they're doing that same thing, but they're taking it to, like, an extreme, like, super chemistry level. Um, Hmm. In Japan, sorry, this is going to seem like a digression, but this is... (laughs) North Coast listeners will be used to this. Uh, (laughs) In Japan, they use certain kinds of yeast to make uh, sake. Oh, really? And every yeah, and uh, every strain of yeast that is used to make sake, I mean, because sake is basically like rice beer. Every strain of yeast that's yeah. used to make sake has like one representative body in one like central place in Japan. It's like the the great Japanese sake yeast bank, and there's like a little vial of every kind of yeast used to make every kind of sake in Japan. Huh. There are some breweries in Colorado that are attempting to do a similar thing. Uh, Crooked Stave is one of them, and they specialize in making sour beers out of, you know, 30 different ingredients and 15 different kinds of yeast. Hmm. So they're trying to... So that's the... Uh... Go ahead. Yeah, so they're trying to do, do basically what they were doing in Japan all these years ago. And maybe yeah, still and, today. And... And in Belgium, and uh, but but in a much more measured, like much more careful sort of way. Yeah, more more controlled than what you would have back there too. Bringing the power of giant nerds to to <laughs> solve a problem that didn't really exist, which is what nerds love to do. So, yeah. so that's the 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 number one trend. Um, the number two trend is uh, to me uh, a thing called a rattler. And, uh, and its cousin, the Shandy, and its, and its Mexican cousin, the, uh, the Michelada, which is a uh, beer that is mixed with, in the case of a Rattler, like a citrus juice. Mm. In uh, the case of a Shandy, these are really popular in like England and Ireland and Scotland, uh, like lemonade or limeade. Mm. And uh, in the case of a Michelada, mixing beer with uh, tomato juice. Or uh, or clamato. You may you may know this as a red beer. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So those are like super popular right now. In fact, at the uh, seminar I was at earlier today, I had uh, I had my choice of uh, three different tomato juices for my michelada. 
Oh, interesting. I turned them all down and got a green Bloody Mary instead, <laughs> which I found very confusing yet delicious. Huh, interesting. So what did they... So what would they put in a green Bloody Mary? I know they make Bloody Marys so many different ways, and they put all kinds of food it was in them and different things. Blended tomatillo. Oh. You know, you know those those uh, those weird little like uh, they look like they're underripe tomatoes, but they're actually like soft and ripe. Oh yeah. Yeah, it was uh, it was tomatillo and basil and mint, like all blended together okay. into like a like a Bloody Mary slurry, and there was like some black pepper and salt, hmm. and. Uh, you know, a little bit of vodka as a, as a Bloody Mary would warrant. But, mm. uh, but yeah, so, uh, so um, Rattlers, uh, Shandies, and Micheladas are probably the number two trend. Uh, the number three trend is uh, cheap, crappy beer. <laughs> that, isn't that always a trend? <laughs> well, well, no, 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 no. But, but the, the thing that makes it a trend is that it's like, because most like cheap, crappy beers are regional. Right. Right. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. Cheap, crappy beers from other regions. Like, for example, in Colorado, uh, is kind of the crappy beer of choice in the uh, what was, upper sir? Midwest. In the upper Midwest, uh, hams is very popular. You know, we, I, you and I have had a couple of conversations about uh, the power of hams, but uh, <laughs> on the East Coast, the traditional crappy beers are uh, Genesee Cream Ale. And uh, Utica Club. Oh. So now I'm seeing this thing where like hams and high life are starting to gain in popularity on the East Coast, while Genesee and Utica Club are starting to make their way into the bars here in the West. Mm. But there is another contender. Uh oh. El Luchador, the mm. uh, the cheap Mexican beer. Which mm-hmm. comes in either uh, Modelo Especial or uh, Tecate flavors. Which I mean, they're all the same. They all taste about the same. Mm. It's just the the print on the can and the story behind it, and all the all the yelling that the guy at the bar does <laughs> when you're like Genesee Cream Ale sucks, and some guy from Boston is like, Ah, you fucking yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that, that's a pretty good Boston accent there. I could throw the fucking ball out of the Johnny Damon. <laughs> back and queer uh yeah so those yeah, so are... that's uh trend number three is uh cheap beer expanding its reach which good if you if you like cheap beer drink it i i look i people ask me all the time what should i drink drink what you like yeah yeah um so those are the top three trends in beer According to uh, what Dusty has seen from his beer, uh, his his beer. Yeah, your beer showed you what the top three trends are. No, uh, his his experience from bartending mm-hmm. has showed him what the top uh, trends are, at least in the Denver area. Dusty, what are uh, the top three trends in liquor that you have seen over the past year or so? Uh, funny you ask. I just went to a really amazing seminar today. And this is going to get like super sciencey, <laughs> and I, I apologize for people who don't care about uh, sciencey nerdy things. But these are you ask the question. Yeah, <laughs> I know. Okay. All right. I'm just kidding. <laughs> All right. You, you just take a nap and I'll talk. I'll wake, I'll wake you up when I'm done. Okay. Blow my air horn into the microphone. Um, so a big trend now is uh, this thing called fat washing. Hmm. Remember when I was talking about the uh, the butter flavored, the yeah. the butter and coke Pop, flavored yeah, rum and coke tastes like popcorn and coke. Yeah. So the way the guy got the rum to do that was to uh, like melt some butter, like literally melt butter, and take some white rum, just like Cruzan or whatever white rum, and uh, put them together in a container, and then freeze the contents of that container, and then once frozen strain out all the solids and then the resulting rum will have a lot of the flavors of the butter but none of the fats or oils it's a it's a really weird like i'm I'm not gonna i'm not gonna bore you too much with the chemistry of it but um it has to do with uh polar and non-polar molecules like uh 
like water is polar. Mm. Um, a lot of flavor molecules are polar. Uh, fats and oils are nonpolar. Alcohol mm. uh, goes both ways. Okay. Alcohol is sometimes polar and sometimes not. Okay. And so alcohol makes a and alcohol has a, a a much lower freezing point. In other words, you have to get alcohol much colder to freeze it than you do water or like anything with fat, anything like butter, for example. Mm. And uh, what you do when you freeze these things together and you strain out the solids is you you end up with uh, an alcohol that has absorbed most of the flavors without any of the like fats or oils or like bad flavors of the fat that you wash it with. And you can, it doesn't have to, I'm sorry for the sirens. <laughs> Tis Denver. Um, <laughs> well, well, and I live like right in the middle of town, um, like five blocks from a hospital. So uh. late nights are always exciting. Um, <laughs> so, you can do this with like coconut oil, uh, olive oil works well too. Basically any, any like fatty thing that has a lot of flavor, don't, you, don't do it with something that can go rancid. I mean, there are a lot of bars that have done like bacon fat, fat washed alcohol, like a, a bacon vodka for Bloody Marys is the most popular mm. use for this technique. But, okay. uh, you can impart the flavor of any fat into alcohol just by uh, freezing it with a uh, melted quantity of said fat. Mm. So that's number one. Uh, number two is um, kind of the cousin to that. It's called uh, milk washing. Oh, all right. You can take a uh, quantity of alcohol and mix it with milk. And uh, if you add citric acid to the mixture, then all well, actually this is okay. So this is uh, making a milk punch. Okay. If you add a uh, a certain quantity of citric acid to your milk and liquor mixture, then all of the curds will bloop, fall out of solution. Oh. And you'll end up with alcohol that has milk whey in it. You know, like a, a Little Miss Muffet. Curds okay. and whey. Yeah. Curds gone. Whey stays. <laughs> All right. And uh, the, the, the reason you would want to do this is because uh, sometimes like, uh, like Irish coffee or, um, you know, any other, like a, like a, like a hot toddy, any, any cocktail that contains milk likes to separate mm -hmm. when you use like regular alcohol. But if you use a, like a milk punch type alcohol, then it'll stay in solution. The texture will be uniform. It'll stay nice and creamy the whole time. Mm. And the, uh, the third trend is uh, acid fixing juices. Okay. What if I told you I could make orange juice taste like lemon juice? Oh wow, that'd be that'd be interesting. <laughs> yeah, but but it still kind of tastes like orange juice, but mostly lemon juice. Hmm. Uh, what if I told you I could replicate the way that lime juice feels in your mouth with two kinds of acid and water? You're crazy. Not like not like, <laughs> not like LSD acid, but just like <laughs> like like citric acid and malic acid and some water. Okay. And you get the, the way that lime juice feels in your mouth without any lime flavor. So it's basically just playing tricks on your mind or your taste buds, per perhaps? Um, it's not, well, it's not really playing tricks because one of the things that your tongue is really good at is uh, telling you how acid something is. Mm. And, yeah. uh, like, here's the, here's the nerdy part. So there is about uh, six grams per liter of citric acid in lemon juice. No, oh, okay. So if you take a, any juice or really any liquid and, you know, do the math and get it up to that six grams per liter, you know, ratio, 
then whatever it tastes like, it'll taste like that plus lemon juice. Oh. Or, or your, your, your mind will, will imagine lemon juice. So maybe, maybe it is kind of playing tricks on your mind. If you, uh, if you do the same thing, but you substitute one-third of that citric acid with malic acid, then you'll get the effect of uh, lime juice. Oh, okay. And there's more stuff you can do. You can, you can simulate the, uh, the dryness of champagne with uh, tartaric acid uh, and malic acid. There's, once you start doing this sort of thing, there's, there's a whole um, deep, dark hole you can dive down. But uh, the use of powdered acids to uh, change the way that juices work in cocktails is uh, trend number three. All right. Well, that is quite the list of things I had mostly never heard of, really, honestly. <laughs> you're, you're sitting back in your chair like, what the F is he talking about? <laughs> and uh, many different things I can try once I turn 21, I guess. Uh, so, well, yeah. Consider yourself having a very generous head start on some very, very technical things. And uh, I, I will, uh, I'll include a couple of links if people are interested in reading more about these concepts. Yeah, yeah, if you are interested in hearing more about these trends or in the beer or the liquor side, please uh, let Dusty know, or Dusty can give me the links and I can give them to you or whatever. Yeah, we can find a way to let you guys uh, read up more or find out more information about any of those things. And I'm sure there are plenty of my Facebook friends and people on Twitter. Oh, my. Uh, <laughs> that, uh, that will, uh, enjoy some of these, uh, new trends or, uh, find them interesting at least, and maybe try them, uh, because they sound interesting. So, uh, thank okay, you so, uh, for those. Some, uh, one, one, one last thing on that, on the, yes. uh, the, the liquor trend. Sorry. <laughs> if you want to do a fun experiment at home, uh, get yourself some powdered citric acid. A, uh, a small quantity can be had on Amazon for like $10. It's not a big deal. Uh, make yourself a milk syrup, like, uh, like way out. This is a milk and mix, uh, eight ounces of sugar into it. And then add just a tiny bit of citric acid to it. And it will thicken up to the consistency of, uh, like glue. Oh, all right. And taste delicious. So basically... Basically, it'll be like the consistency of like glue you said, but like kind of like a malt or a shake. Um, like instant condensed milk. Oh, okay. Like you can you can skip past all the uh, the heat and everything, and just instantly condense milk chemically with citric acid. Oh. And I'll, that... uh, I'll 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 share a link with with more specific instructions how to do that, but it, it literally takes five seconds. And your like milky milk syrup goes from milk consistency to the consistency of the milk that like you know when you're little and you like make one bowl of frosted flakes mm -hmm. and then eat like three bowls of frosted flakes with the same milk. Yeah. Yeah. You're you're left with that same thing. Yeah. Yeah, that that taste of Oh, you know, that reminds me, that is so good. That that's one of the reasons I like cereal is because you get that, you get the taste of the cereal inside the milk. It tastes so good, usually. So speaking of cereal, let's move on to food. Dusty, your favorite food, uh, one of your favorite foods at least. I know it's hard to pick one favorite because food is food, but if you had to pick one or a couple, what would your favorite foods be? Man, um, a bowl of noodles. Like I, I'm, a, I'm a tall and obviously very white person, but <laughs> I love a good bowl. And I'm not talking like, uh, like spaghetti and meatballs. Like right. whether it's pho or ramen or like Chinese Szechuan beef noodle. And actually, yeah, you know what? F it. Includes spaghetti and meatballs. I love noodles. Noodly doodly do. Yeah. <laughs> Noodly doodly. Yeah, no, uh, noodles, noodles, even though it's not, like, 
it's not uh, normally American like right like right away, but it has become such an American thing where you go. Of course, obviously, you got the Italian noodles like the spaghetti you mentioned. But then you got uh, Chinese noodles that are different. Like I don't know if you have a Hoo Hot in Denver or not, but like Hoo Hot, they serve like three different types of noodles. And, oh my gosh, and, love Hoo Hot. Oh, I can get down on some Mongolian BBQ any day of the week. I love Hoo Hot. That is like my favorite place to eat. There's, there's um, one like three blocks from uh, my very noisy apartment where the sirens go by. Oh man, you are lucky. I've got to drive thirty, thirty miles to the to South Dakota to Sioux Falls. That's but, like a that's like a dinner vacation. Yeah, that's right. And, and you know, sometimes <laughs> we we do make that vacation because we're like. Oh, I don't want to eat here again. We just ate there earlier this week, and when you only have when you only have four rest, four to five, maybe six restaurants, just depending on what you count. If you count bars and everything, which I mean, we should, since you're on the show. Um, well, okay, there's still okay. Not so very let me many. let me put this in perspective for you. How long does it take you to drive that thirty miles? What, forty five, maybe fifty minutes? Uh, no, it's, it takes pretty well the same amount. I think, I think, let's see, Sioux Falls, just depending, 30 to 35 miles, I think. And that, and traffic usually is pretty good unless you've run into being behind a farmer or a truck or something like that. Because I only, my, my town is in Rock Rapids. There's only about 2,600 people. The area is so rural. So, yeah. So you're looking at like 40 minutes, maybe 45. Yeah. To get that 30 miles. Yeah, just depending on traffic, yep. Yeah. Uh, well, <laughs> depending on traffic, to go six miles across town to get something I really like takes 45 minutes to an hour. <laughs> oh, man. No unless joke. you're unless you're Unless you're walking, maybe. Uh, actually, a uh, bicycle is the preferred mode of transportation as long as it's not like raining okay. and hailing like it was when we started this podcast. <laughs> oh man. Um but yeah, like, you know the the struggle is real no matter where you are. Like you can yeah. you can you can seem close to something and still not be close. But uh so but can I can I tell so you a uh, a not very well kept secret Go in a podcast? It. Go for it. I can eat pizza every day forever until I die. <laughs> as a college student, I can do that as well. <laughs> no, 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 no. I'm, Even after college, you are. It's been it's been over a decade <laughs> since I left college. I'm I used to manage a pizza place, and I would eat like four. And these are like like slices off of like a twenty to twenty two inch pie. I would eat like four slices of cheese pizza a night. And mm. even the cooks were like, "Dude, don't you ever get sick of pizza?" And I'd be like, no, 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 no. <laughs> not at all. I love it. I love it. Yeah, I think uh, yeah, my cousin uh, Jonah works at a uh, pizza ranch. You maybe don't even know what a pizza ranch is. Oh, my God. I totally know what a pizza ranch is. I love pizza ranch. Oh, well, then, good. That's good. Do they, I, actually, uh, they don't actually have a lot I... of money at the pizza ranch in Morris, Minnesota. Ah. Uh... Morris. All right. All right. Yeah. I had some friends that were going to college there. It was a it was a strange time for all of us. <laughs> and was there any in North Dakota that you remember? Uh, there was one in Jamestown that I never okay. visited. Um, I haven't been there, but I I think there's one in my hometown, Grand Forks now. Okay. I'm, I don't know. I'm I'm a, I'm a very bad Midwesterner. I don't go home and visit my mother enough. Hi, mom. <laughs> she's she's she doesn't use email or text she's never going to listen to this if dusty's mom is listening by some miracle that he never thought of hello to Aww. dusty's mom Aww. thank you for tuning in <laughs> and listening to me and dusty go on on and on and on <laughs> i'm sure she's enjoying every second of it if she's listening <laughs> You never talk this long with me. No, that's not what she. <laughs> that's not what she would say. Oh man, that's funny. Oh, um, so that's that's one of Dusty's favorite things, uh, noodles. And you said pizza. Now, what are the top three trends? Pizza is always a trend, so don't count that. <laughs> 
Well, um, I've got two trends, one which I like and one which I don't. Okay. The, uh, the trend I like is uh, poke. Poke. Uh, with poke, it's a, it's a Hawaiian dish. Oh, that makes sense. It's uh, like fresh fish, you know, whatever you caught that day, filleted, cut up, and then tossed in uh, some soy sauce and vinegar with maybe like a little bit of ginger and hot sauce. Mm. And then served over hot rice with maybe, you know, some fresh vegetables, whatever's in your garden, like some greens, like some mizuna or some lettuce or some arugula or some tomatoes, whatever you got. Mm. But it's just like like cold fish tossed in a soy ginger spicy sauce over rice. It's uh, There's a place right around the corner from my house that uh, does amazing poke bowls and they're, they're they're you know gussying it up there's uh there's a place in la called the uh, hokey pokey <laughs> yeah and then wow. there's like the uh uh they, they they even suggest that you turn yourself around on the menu but uh <laughs> but it, it's basically like a like a chipotle <laughs> of poke <laughs> well isn't that puntastic it's so punny. <laughs> I know, right? Well, no, okay, no, no. So, so let me tell you the, the technical reason why that works. The only, like, you don't have to have a hot kitchen to make poke. The only things you need are rice steamers and a freezer to store your fish and proper, like, fish cutting and storage procedures. You don't have to have a grill. You don't mm. have to have a hood. You can, you can take an old frozen yogurt place and turn it into a poke place. So it appeals to operators because they're very cheap to operate. And the food is delicious, and it's healthy. Um, done correctly, it's amazing. Hokey Pokey is adorable. It's like the, uh, like I said, it's like the, the Chipotle of poke. Uh, you just, you walk in, they start a rice bowl for you, and you just tell them what you want on it, and then you pay for it, and you eat your delicious food, and then you go. That's what it's all about. <laughs> <laughs> that is what it's all about. <laughs> Oh my gosh! When when we're uh, when we're done here, I'm gonna I'm gonna send you a picture. Man, this is uh, so many so many listener teases. I'm gonna have to include links to a lot of things. <laughs> That's right. At Dusty O'Connell on Twitter. <laughs> if you okay, but seriously, if you live in the Los Angeles area uh, and any of this sounds appealing to you, uh, go to the Hokey Pokey downtown. It's uh, it's pretty much the only good thing about downtown LA, other than Bottega Louie which is like two blocks away. It'll make you turn around. <laughs> <laughs> I know, this is terrible. <laughs> you're, you're just killing it. Well, well I'm, I'm going to, uh, to end on a rant. Okay, that's good. That's There's good. a creeping trend in food that I deeply dislike, and it's not regional. It has nothing to do with any particular part of America. It's happening everywhere. But it's happening faster in the trendy places. So not that, here. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, it's probably ha- it's probably happening close to you too. In fact, when I when when I describe it, you'll probably be like, "Oh my god, it is happening! Uh, it's happening everywhere!" It's like no! a no, it's like a slow crawling zombie apocalypse. <laughs> the zombies are attacking. <laughs> Food that has to be two things. All right. Let's hear it. For example, a sushi burrito. Oh. Which is a uh, a burrito or it it is it well basically it's sushi ingredients wrapped up burrito style. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, no, I hear you. Or a uh chicken nacho. Ah. Okay, so Basically, like just putting chicken on your nachos, or am I? Lying? No, no, no. I'm talking about the uh, the the Taco Bell like all chicken chip. Like it's not. Oh. It's it's chicken in a triangle, but it's also a nacho. Okay. Okay. Why I can't think... it just be chicken or nachos? Why does it have to be two things? Why can't it just be sushi or a burrito? Why does it have to be two things? Yeah, yeah, no, I I hear what you're saying. 
I guess I guess for some some things I think it works. Like I've had like basically it's like a Mexican burger, I guess you would call it. Like you have guacamole on it and you kind of got like the different so maybe the different toppings you would normally have like on a uh, in a burrito or something. And you kind of put it on a burger or I've done it where I basically make a sandwich that's a burrito, or that I put it into a, a shell where I put ham and I put mayonnaise on there and maybe some of the toppings I'd normally put in a sandwich, I'd put in the burrito and I'd eat it like, like that. Maybe maybe that's not totally what you're meaning, but I guess that's kind no, of... No, I, I, w- I, w- I would call that uh, fusion cuisine, which is uh, maybe not trendy, but uh, but still acceptable. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but the... Uh... But yeah, I. But would you say the Mexican, the burger, like with the guacamole and that kind of thing, would be, or would you say that's no, even no, different? That, no, that's fine. Uh, as long as you're not putting an actual taco inside of a bun <laughs> and calling it a taco burger. <laughs> okay, there we go. Then, uh, then, then that's fine. Um, there's a uh, there's a couple of other good examples of a uh, food that tries to be two things and can't just be one thing. Um, let's see, this is. Where I wish I had my own annotated show notes, but uh, <laughs> that's a uh, that's the flash. Um, what? Uh, quickly, I was just going to ask you, what what is your opinion on pineapple on pizza? Love it. Thank you. <laughs> That... Oh my gosh, you believe in you Oh, excellent. Yes. I I love sweet swine. It's so good. You know, actually I, I think my my larger issue is uh, is actually with Taco Bell. Cuz I'm looking <laughs> at the uh, the naked chicken chips. They don't have to be chicken and chips. You can you can have one or the other. But why not have them both, Dusty? <sighs> <laughs> because food should just be itself. Food doesn't have to be two things. You can have chicken. You can have chips. I don't understand why we have to have them all at once. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> it's it's one of those things where you either like it or you don't. Basically. It, well, look, I I, I just think, think that like I, I okay, guess. So you, we, you were talking about uh, like Mexican burgers, you know, yep. a, a burger with like guac and salsa, and um, you know, maybe, uh, maybe, maybe some other traditionally like Mexican ingredients. Yeah. Uh, maybe some tortilla straws or whatever. That's fine. That's a uh, that's a combination of cultures. Mm-hmm. You know, and yeah. uh, I, I can appreciate the value of a uh, of a, a bowl of pho that is not. Fully traditionally Vietnamese, you know. I'm 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 fine with adding stuff to pho, mm-hmm. but when you make things like the naked chicken chips box, <laughs> where you have chips that are made of chicken and a burrito that is made of a taco, like like Saturday Night Live already did a skit about how ridiculous this is. Yeah, and then we take that pizza and wrap it up in a taco shell, and then and <laughs> Andy Stamberg is like pizza. Now that's a taco, <laughs> and it's yeah. just like I I feel like we may have wandered too far afield. Like we may have lost the plot somewhere along the way. Like I'm I'm all about combining cultures in in delicious ways. I mean, I think I, I think I've made that like sentiment pretty clear over the course of this interview. But yes, at the same time, there's there's gotta be a line and when you start saying shit like sushi burritos and naked chicken chips like maybe we should just take a step back yeah yeah i i don't think that the sushi burrito sounds too good at all i mean it's hard to make mess up just a like that taste of a burrito but i don't don't know if it sounds good to me well spoiler alert it's not good (laughs) there you go you heard it first here on the shuby show Sushi, sushi tacos, burritos, not sushi that great. Burritos, <laughs> not good. <laughs> you can find him on Twitter at Dusty O'Connell. 
<laughs> if you People, disagree with this hot take, I, I, no one's going to disagree with that. Not very hot not, take. That um, is like a very, that is like an Ian Kenyon lukewarm take. <laughs> uh, Colin Kaepernick might be employable. That's not a hot take. <laughs> Maybe not anymore. Hmm. <laughs> mm, also not a hot take. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, a reef still seems to think that he has something left. I I don't know. I just didn't see anything the last couple of years, but thought he kind of well, digressed. He's a, but... he's a tough guy to build an offense around, you know. Yeah, that's true too. I mean, I'd and if probably... you're looking for a job, that's like because that's the thing is that like when you're kicking the tires on a quarterback, you know, it's it's like it's not like buying a car. It's like buying a house. Mm-hmm. Like you're yeah. walking around the yard, you're like checking out the foundation. You're like, all right, what, I, what am I going to do with this for the next five or 10 years? Am I going to make any money on this? Like mm-hmm. you buy a car, you're just like, whatever, I'm just going to drive this until it dies and then like walk away from it when it's smoking on the highway. <laughs> but yeah. you can't do that with a house, it turns out. So, <laughs> Who knew? so the, the, the Colin Kaepernick house market is, I, I think I got too confused with this analogy. I'm, you get the point. <laughs> the Colin Kaepernick house market is soft. Yes, it is. It is. That is for sure. They uh, didn't wait to burn him into the ground, apparently, in San Francisco. The golden garbage can. <laughs> That's right. That's right. But, you know, I thought he would be an interesting fit uh, in Seattle. I think I think he kind of fits what Russell Wilson does a little bit. I think Wilson maybe does a few things that aren't the same and I'm not I'm not a scout that can tell you oh well he doesn't do this the same he does that the same but he doesn't do that he doesn't do that you know but I feel like he's got the same skill set he's got the speed he's got the ability to throw on the run like Wilson even though Wilson is probably a better and more complete pocket passer but yeah well know. yeah similar but not the same I think Wilson is just like generally better at everything yeah <laughs> <laughs> I mean, they're they're no, but you're. I mean, you're right. They're similar in style, but I just Russell Wilson is like ready for prime time, and yep. Cap is. Uh, eh. Yep, yep. And it was so. like, what? Are, what are the Seahawks going to get rid of Russell Wilson so they can get Colin Kaepernick? Like that's even <laughs> even be, Pete Carroll ain't that crazy. Eh, he wants to spend that money though. Ah, yeah, yeah. this is this is a discussion better left for our other podcast, Norse Code. <laughs> Great which you can timing. listen to at NorseCodePodcast.com. Or subscribe on iTunes, Norse Code. And subscribe to this show on iTunes, the Shuby Show, and everywhere else that fine podcasts are aggregated, right, Dusty? You totally stole that line from me. Uh, I got to tell you though, Norse code uh, does not copy does not have any copyrights. Well, no, it's uh, if if you look at our iTunes page, it says uh, Creative Commons licensed, attribution required. Oops. So if you're going to be cribbing my nonsense, you better give us credit. <laughs> Norse Code is the number one podcast for your Minnesota Vikings. Please listen to that. Uh, by uh, every other week during the off season, as that is our uh, that's our formula. Every other week in the off season, that's yeah, that's that's a good that's good. Every that's other a lot of credit. It's our formula. <laughs> uh, you could follow Norse Code. <laughs> on twitter if i did go you don't, you don't have to do my promo that's fine that's my job you can just <laughs> do your own promo. I, in fact i can do your promo for you if you want <laughs> you go for it <laughs> uh, uh which episode is this what what episode number this do, is do, episode... do you number your episodes yes we did a lot of we did a lot of pre-show planning we actually like <laughs> <laughs> this is episode number 15 of the shooby show this has been episode 15 of the Shuby Show. You can find the Shuby Show on Twitter at the S-C-H-U-B-Y show. All right. Your host Carson is uh, at Radio Ruben on Twitter. I have been your guest, Dusty O'Connell, at Dusty O'Connell on Twitter. No apostrophe, two <laughs> N's and two L's. Uh, please listen to Norse Code if you care at all about the Minnesota Vikings, or even if you don't. It's a Pretty good football show.
we uh, we're proud of the work we do. We we tangent and, off uh, frequently. Yeah. <laughs> And uh, we're uh, glad to have the crew we do. And you can find Norse Code at Norse Code DN on Twitter or at NorseCodePodcast.com. Uh, Carson's guest's website is uh, DustinO'Connell.com. Uh, you can find his beverage services at BespokeBeverageServices.com. And uh, do you have any... Uh, any links or like parting shots that I can? Uh... Um. Well, I, 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 you can send me links for some of that stuff if you want. I can put it in the description. Oh, we'll uh, we'll fill out the description with uh, links of all the things we were talking about on the show tonight. Yes, and that will be a very big description list this time. <laughs> Which is all right. Many things that you can do to interact with the show. So please do that. And uh, I think that's it, Dusty. You got anything else to add? Well, I got to tell you what. There's nothing I love more than talking about myself. And this has been a beautiful forum to do so. I am grateful for the opportunity. And I hope that I was able to teach your listeners a, a thing or two tonight. Thank you so much for having me on. Well, I appreciate you coming on and uh, putting up with my nonsense, the never-ending nonsense with yours truly, Carson Schubert. That is going to do it for the show. Again, subscribe, rate, review. Please review the show if you have not already, and I don't think anybody has, but please review the show on iTunes or on Google Play Music or wherever you can review things. I don't, I don't know. Uh, wherever, wherever we are... Uh, please review us, subscribe to us on YouTube, uh, help us grow. Uh, we've grown each month of the show so far, and as always, thanks for listening. I'm Carson Schubert, a.k.a. Shuby, saying we'll see you next week. Again, thanks to Dusty for joining me. Skull. Thanks for listening to The Shuby Show. We hope you mildly enjoyed yourself with more never-ending nonsense with yours truly. For more nonsense, go to the website, theshubyshow.com. Get the show on iTunes, Google Play, YouTube, Stitcher, and TuneIn Radio. Until next time, skull.